Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the DSA webinar on aligning climate and development finance to reduce poverty and emissions. I just wanted to let you know before we start that this session is going to be recorded. I'm Uma Kamhampati, and I'm the president of the Development Studies Association, which is hosting this webinar today. The DSA, as you may or may not know, is the UK-based membership organization for everybody who's studying, researching, or teaching in the field of global development. It recognizes the need for development practitioners and researchers to be more greatly involved in discussions around climate finance, and this webinar is the first step that we are taking to try and bring together those who have knowledge of climate finance and development finance together so that we can take these discussions forward. Now, this is only one such activity that the DSA um, does uh, over the course of the year. We have a number of study groups that you could join. Uh, there is a book series and uh, a very lively hybrid conference that you can also be a part of. The next one will be in SOAS in London. And details of these will appear in the chat uh, during this session. So if you're new to the DSA and would like to join us, do come back, consider becoming involved in one of our activities in the future. Uh, I won't take much longer now. I'll hand over to Annalisa Pritzon. Um, who is a DSA council member and also principal research fellow at the global think tank, the ODI. Annalisa has been researching and advising governments and multilateral agencies on the allocation effectiveness uh, of international public finance. Um, and we look forward to hearing today's discussion, which will bring together, of course, both development and climate finance. Over to you, Annalisa. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Uma, for your introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining online today. And I'm really delighted to moderate this very exciting panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, Uma, you introduced me by stressing my research interest uh, in a number of dimensions of international public finance. Uh, I have to admit, uh, I know very little about climate policy, and I cannot certainly speak about it uh, uh, authoritatively. But it was a no-brainer to me that I had to better understand uh, what climate finance supports, uh, how it is funded uh, and allocated. We often advocated that we should not work uh, in silos and take a more kind of system-wide approach. Uh, and that is why, as an academic, uh, I found learning about climate policy, climate finance, actually from many colleagues who were already in the call, uh, so enriching, but most importantly, so decisive to help us articulate meaningful recommendations, in my case, on the allocation of very scarce, scarce concessional finance resources, uh, tailored to the kind of complexity of our current challenges. But the discussion about the integration of climate and development uh, is certainly not simple. Uh, the rise of global temperatures and climate change up in the international uh, agenda is both a threat uh, and an opportunity for development uh, and poverty alleviation. It's considered as a threat because of a focus on reducing emissions and may be perceived, uh, as stress may be perceived, uh, to come at the expense of international and national development efforts uh, because it's perceived to be more expensive than traditional development strategies, it might divert funds and also political capital away from development. Part of the problem is the lingering misconception that climate action inevitably entails a trade-off with economic development, that the climate agenda is essentially a burden-sharing exercise and it should instead focus on poverty eradication. However, it is becoming overwhelmingly clear that inaction on climate change undermines a sets back inclusive development and the fight against poverty. The rise of global te temperatures and climate change up in the international agenda can indeed be an opportunity because the issues that climate change brings to the fore are similar to those that matter for development. Overlaps, complementarities and synergies exist between investment and policies for development and those to mitigate and adapt to climate change. 
I'm always thinking about the example on the improve, improvements and the technical progress when it comes to low carbon solutions. They are becoming the least expensive ones. And uh, in some cases, I think about the distributed renewable energy. Sometimes it's the only realistic option so to give energy access to millions of people who are currently off the grid, uh, off grid in, in poor countries. And some of you might know that uh, over the past year, there's been a lot of discussion uh, on the reform of international financial institutions, for example, the World Bank, on how to integrate uh, the development and the climate agenda. It's being endorsed, uh, the new mission, uh, Award Free of Poverty on a Livable Planet. Uh, but I have to say there was a bumpy road over the past year, and it somehow replicates the tensions I've just described uh, on the entire debate between climate and development. So I'm really delighted to introduce my fellow panelists. I count on them to help us understand how development and climate finance systems can be better aligned to be more effective, help us understand their synergies and how to address the potential trade-offs that are there in the short term. So let me just start by introducing Leia Achaponga. Leia is a senior policy and advocacy officer at Eurodad, the European network on debt and development. Leia joined Eurodad three years ago to start, uh, actually I was talking about the integration and the work on climate and development. She started Eurodad's policy work uh, and research on climate finance, and that includes building capacity in the network of civil society organizations on climate finance. Biniam Gebreyes is a senior researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IAED. Biniam is an experienced climate negotiator and currently coordinates negotiations on the adaptation theme on behalf of the least developed countries group. Biniam worked for the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change of Ethiopia, serving as the environment law expert. Next, uh, Chara Tesfaye is, uh, is now Associate Director, Climate Justice at Open Society Foundation, but he joins from E3G. Um, his areas of interest are the intersection between climate policy and trade, transitions to clean economy, just transitions and climate finance. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Will Worley is the new policy reporter, editor at the new, new humanitarian and former climate correspondent and DAVEX, and he covered the intersection uh, of climate and, de and development for quite a long time. So I'll turn to the panel very shortly, but I would like to tell everyone online uh, that uh, there will be space uh, for uh, question and answers, so start popping them uh, in the chat. So without further ado, let me start with the kind of first question, and I would like to turn to Leia. Leia, I would like to start with a very broad uh, but fundamental question. How can development and climate finance systems uh, be better aligned to be more effective? Uh, what are the key messages uh, you can share from your partner organizations? Leia, over to you. Uh, thank you, Annalisa, and hello, everyone. I'm Leia, um, and I'm happy to be invited to this webinar, and I'm looking forward to the discussion with you all. Um, so as has already been stressed by Annalisa, um, the climate crisis is eradicating gains made in the Sustainable Development Goals, it's indebting countries and, and it's causing inequalities. And climate finance is a part of the solution, but there's a need to ensure that it is of a high quality. Um, I first want to stress that um, the, the importance of UN climate finance versus climate related official development assistance or ODA. Some countries in the global south um, are middle income countries, but they're still highly vulnerable to climate change. Um, but as middle income countries, they're not eligible for um, for ODA, for official development assistance. Um, and so that's why it's really important and vital for uh, climate finance under the auspices of the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, it's important for those goals to be met because all countries in the global south have access to UNFCCC uh, climate finance. Um, I, I think another aspect around um, in, ensuring that climate finance is in effective and has those synergies with development is around um, ensuring that climate finance supports community wide transformations to uh, tackling climate change. Um, uh, yet there's a lot of data on the gender responsiveness on climate finance that is missing. However, gender tagging of climate related ODA is, is higher and that 
makes it easier to um, aggregate levels and to determine what are the best trends. So the, the first sort of um, key message that I would have is for uh, countries in the global north to be speaking with their um, counterparts in development um, ministries um, in order to determine how to put in place structures to tag and to collect and report on data on the gender responsiveness of climate finance, because clearly development ministries in the global north do have these structures in place because they are tagging um, uh, they are tagging data and information on the gender responsiveness of climate related ODA at far higher levels. I think um, another point is around um, not replicating some of the existing models in development finance that have been um, shown to be ineffective at supporting achievement of the sustainable development goals. So by that, I mean things such as um, blended finance and um, uh, PPPs, so public-private partnerships, all of which have been shown to um, uh, increase indebtedness in in countries in the global south. At times, they're more expensive than um, uh, than if a country were to make, be able to make use of highly concessional finance. And all of this has implications on um, the effectiveness of climate finance with it, of, within a community. Um, another aspect is around um, the fact that with such high financing needs, a lot of countries in the global south are seeking finance from um, international financial institutions such as the World Bank, which is an institution that has a history of making use of policy conditionalities. Um, and we're, what we're seeing is that this is being replicated within the climate finance sphere. Um, so either through um, climate climate goals being integrated into the World Bank's development policy lending, which uses policy conditionalities, or through green policy conditionalities being um, made use of uh, within climate finance flows provided by international financial institutions. And this is part of the ongoing trend in the financialization and um, uh, financial institution capture of climate finance. And this impacts um, this this then leads to a level of uh, influence over the design of domestic economic and climate policies um, and some of the policies that are being um, pushed through policy conditionalities are gendered such as austerity um, which can lead to public services cuts and um, these are services that are typically used by women and so um, the, these are the the first three key things that I wanted to share about how to um, strength and synergies between uh, development and, and climate finance uh, contributors. Um, it's about ensuring um, that there's high quality finance, ensuring that there is uh, access for all countries in the global south. It's about in improving the transparency processes, particularly around um, the gender responsiveness on climate finance. And it's about not replicating some of the more, more um, ineffective uh, trends and practices in development finance, such as blended finance policy conditionalities, et cetera. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Leia, for your initial messages. If I can also kind of bring uh, a couple of one, we're talking about affordable finance that becomes even more important given the scale and the implications of the current debt crisis, uh, but also coordination uh, on climate and development within uh, the governments in the global north. And that's a very kind of important point that uh, you raised as well on the kind of gender responsiveness of climate. Uh, well, can I come to you, Amina? You've been reporting uh, on these issues for a number of years. Uh, how do layers uh, points resonate with you? And particularly, what are the lessons you gather across institutions and countries on the alignment of climate and development goals, if any? Over to you, Will. Thank you. And thank you so much for, for having me on this panel. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've only been in my, my new position a few uh, few weeks. Um, so I'll kind of caveat by this by saying I'm now focused more on the humanitarian um, sector crises side of policy. Previously, I was covering development um, and where that interacted with climate finance. Um, I never spoke to, with Leia in that role, but the point she raises about the policy conditionality and um, uh, various um, negative outcomes of that coming about as, as a result of it, I think is really interesting. I hope my colleagues, um, is that something they kind of follow up? Um, 
the transparency point as well is is really important. I mean, I think we maybe I'll come to the bigger picture concerns later, but there is a real concern around the the transparency of 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 climate finance. There, you know, a, a lot of things being reported as climate finance. You know, Reuters did a really big uh, investigation where they showed that there were all sorts of things being reported as climate finance as climate finance, and you know, many of them just just patently were not, and um, a lot of stuff still is being um, reported in that way. And there's a big issue of trust or mistrust as a result around climate finance, which links to this bigger problem of, of mistrust in, in the negotiations. Um, so thanks, Leah, for, for raising those points. Um, I mean, very kind of big picture um, in terms of the alignment of climate development goals, and I'm going to sort of include humanitarian and, and development as, as, as sort of a broadly very similar bucket, although not quite, obviously. Um, climate development, humanitarian, these are all spaces which are just sort of starting to, to kind of get to know each other um, and, and take each other kind of seriously. And, um, you know, there's been obviously experts and people very, very knowledgeable about these intersections working away for, for a long, long time. But in terms of at the, the highest levels and in terms of people thinking, oh, no, we actually need to really do something about this. Um, maybe we should go to COP. That's only just sort of starting to, to begin. I think like COP26 was noted by a lot of people for the amount of um, you know NGOs and non-climate sort of civil society who, who turned up. Um, and there's a big push uh, among the humanitarian sector this year to um, to make themselves, make their presence felt uh, at, at COP28 in, in Dubai. Um, they're following a, um, a few different uh, objectives. Obviously, the loss and damage point is is somewhere where the humanitarians advise and, and have a lot of, um, in some respects, have, have a lot of expertise. And apparently that's been quite welcomed by by many on the UNFCCC, um, the humanitarian and development sector have been feeding in to conversations um, about loss and damage. Secondly, this year, there's a, there's a big push for more uh, conflict uh, and fragility sensitivity um, in uh, climate policies, whether in nego negotiations or, or more broadly. Um, the UAE have been doing a lot of work on that. They are hosting a, um, a peace, relief and recovery day on December the 3rd. Uh, which is um, clearly an area where a lot of traditional development and humanitarian actors uh, are going to be looking to to, to be involved. Um, and thirdly, on, on adaptation, the adaptation gap, maybe we'll come back to this, but the adaptation gap report released a few days ago was a real horror show for the world. It showed a massive gap in, in adaptation finance and every year the the authors and the executives behind it they stress that every penny not spent on climate adaptation is is basically racking up further debt for loss and damage further down the road um so there's a massive gap there i think we can maybe come back to this point but adaptation you know maybe binyan would like to um speak a bit more on that this on this uh than i do but like um, it's it's traditional sort of development topics so there's um but you know done in a certain way um i think there's a lot there for the development sector to be explored and you know many people are already on that but it but hasn't filtered down uh to everyone and uh i will stop there well thank you so much i mean you raised a, a, a number of kind of very interesting points i mean the development and the climate community have started to come together and that you mentioned the, the clear example of con 26 and it's kind of expanded over time and already i can see some questions coming up on the loss and damage fund and i'm sure that we will have the kind of uh, the opportunity to go back to this and it's very topical uh, um, and timely right now i would love to kind of go to Chara now, because um, we've been talking about the integration of climate and development, but you've done quite a lot of work on trade policy, and I would love to kind of hear a bit more on this in particular, but some key takeaways are some of the challenges and opportunities that emerge from your own experience and, uh, and research. Chara, over to you. Thank you, Annalise. Uh... I think the this question is a, a very complex question. I don't know what kind of lessons we can directly learn from the trade mechanism, but I'll try to go over some of the proposals that bridge between uh, climate conversations, uh, finance conversations, and trade conversations in, in the uh, uh, reform agenda that we have in front of us. 
to, to start with, uh, trade was playing a very uh, important role, particularly in the 1990s when the WTO came into effect. And after that, uh, in the early 2000s, it was one of the main areas where uh, countries came together to, to uh, decide on policy matters, to push different agenda, even outside the scope of economic interests. For example, we have seen uh, human rights efforts, labor rights efforts, uh, uh, and uh, similar uh, environmental protection, for example, coming through trade uh, mechanisms because they had enforcement arrangements built in them and they were appealing to them. And the arrangement between countries was also working uh, quite well uh, and they, they could provide the, uh, the opportunity for countries to discuss those things. So trade was that that kind of uh, uh, instrumental, it was playing that kind of instrumental role. Uh, in in the past uh, few uh, years, even more than that, in the past 10 years, for example, I think climate has grown into that space and it has become the main area of congregation for uh, international actors. And uh, we've seen a lot of politics around climate. We've seen a lot of changes and policy dialogue on uh, surrounding climate conversations. For example, a lot of finance reform agenda that we have globally has come out of the climate uh, initiative and is guided by climate uh, concerns and climate interests. A lot of conversations in industrial policy uh, uh, now is being propelled by climate interest and climate uh, agenda. So you can make different cases like that. So the reform agenda itself, although we have had a long history of, for example, uh, Leah might be able to speak about this a bit better than I am, I, I can, but uh, the debt movement, for example, has been around for the past uh, 40 years, uh, four decades, and it's been around. But uh, since climate came uh, became part of this conversation, the debt conversation has changed its tone and has become part of this global movement that that we're, we're considering. So a lot of changes in, in that regard. So the, the, the role that trade was playing as a catalytic space and as, as a place where a lot of conversations could happen together is, is now being played by uh, climate and, and the, the reform agenda that we have in front of us. So there is that opportunity. Uh, based on that, I think it's important that we mention some of the things that people are talking about in 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 uh, in the reform agenda. We have some major things. So that we have the Bridgestone agenda. We have older versions of the World Bank uh, reform agenda, the CAF uh, uh, reform agenda, uh, the CAF reform. We have the governance reform conversations happening in the G20 context as well as uh, more broadly uh, globally. We have very uh, uh, newer kinds of versions of. Uh, inclusions to this uh, reform agenda conversation, such as the V20 Accra to Marrakesh agenda, which includes, for example, four topics. It talks about debt for climate. It talks about reforms of the development finance architecture in general. It talks about a new deal for carbon uh, financing, and it talks about risk management and pre-arranged uh, financing. So very broad ranging things. So we have a lot of moving parts in, 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 in this conversation. Uh, there are some pertinent uh, things that are connected with the trade uh, space, particularly, for example, reforms uh, related to how we think about debt and the de the place debt plays uh, in terms of fiscal space, but also in terms of trade financing is is a very important element. Also, what kind of role it could play in in uh, swapping, for example, climate uh, obligations for uh, uh, debts that is already there, uh, the, the climate swaps as they are called now, or debt for climate swaps, those kinds of conversations are also very important. Uh, we've also seen a lot of uh, discussion in, in the architecture reform conversation on export financing. How, how can we reform it so that it can serve the climate purpose is, is the essence of where that conversation is going. Uh, but export financing has been a very challenging topic in, in trade financing for, for a long time. But now adding a layer of climate considerations to that is, is going to be very interesting. Uh, in the interlinkage uh, between... Uh, may I kind of uh, then pick up, because I, I can see a kind of a number of kind of questions uh, coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and we kind of go back, uh, the more you were speaking, the more that we might need a kind of a separate conversation on trade uh, and climate, uh, they're yeah. say. I would love to kind of pick up a, a number of points, particularly when it comes uh, 
the when it comes to the kind of opportunities for climate uh, and development actors to work together that's something we already kind of starting alluding to and i would like i would love to kind of move to binyam uh, um right now i mean i mentioned binyam you you were you worked actually with the minister of environment forest and climate change of ethiopia and i think i, I might have visited you when you were there there i strongly suspect that uh, where you kind of served as a kind of environmental law expert uh, and you have first kind of end experience uh, in climate negotiation and I know this is going to be a very busy month. So in your view, what are the opportunities for climate and development actors to work together much better than they do right now? Over to you, Binim. Thanks. Thanks, Annalisa. Uh, uh, I think I would like to first touch upon uh, one uh, one similar point I was, I was getting from uh, Charalia and uh, Will, uh, which is I think the interlinkages part. Uh, I mean, it would have been uh, it would have made life easier if uh, it was easier to address climate and development in silos. And uh, fair enough, we've tried uh, the the global. Uh, multilateral process has tried to address development in in some siloed approaches, uh, but I think uh, the, the the trends uh, clearly show that unless we address the interlinkages in um, in their entirety, it's going to be very difficult. So. Um, Within, within the negotiation, we've been we've been seeing a lot of move towards this synergy. For example, uh, moving from the uh, Millennium Development Goals to the SDG Goals, and now uh, the strong linkages we see from the UNFCCC negotiation process uh, and its linkage with the SDG is uh, is I think uh, a very good uh, a very good example of how. Uh, we are bringing in the the, the climate uh, and the development discussions much uh, uh, much closer. Um, when whenever I think about uh, climate uh, action or in particular adaptation, which is a priority for a lot of developing countries, um, for me it's uh, adaptation is development plus or kind of the the pro version of of development where uh, it's very difficult to to draw a line on um, or uh, a black and white between between them. So uh, in that context, I think there is a there is a strong understanding was um, from the key actors from the public and non-public sector. Um, I have more worked with uh, within the public sector and then now working with governments. Uh, and I, I think there is a growing recognition about the synergies and the trade-offs considerations uh, that I think have been mentioned. Uh, looking at, for example, the IPCC report, uh, there is a clear indication that um, the the human human development side of goals uh, and the environmental uh, aspect uh, uh, seen in in synergy uh, and considering their trade-offs would really uh, put us on a, a sustainable development pathway which then um, helps us meet uh, you know intergenerational equity uh, and all those values that we uh, see so uh, one of the one of the ways we're seeing uh, this is through policy coherence uh, and there is a growing um, increase in how governments align their development plans where with their uh, adaptation action we're seeing a lot of reference to uh, to all sectoral considerations in the national adaptation plans in the ndc's which i think is a very good thing macroeconomic policies um, having uh, climate considerations will uh, will i think address those those trade-offs and um, synergies um, and I think there is also uh, a, a concern, for example, within the LDC group, there is a, there is a concern that uh, in accessing climate finance in particular, uh, such demarcation, trying to demarcate, does have implication on access channels. Uh, for example, countries have struggled um, in the past to access climate finance from the GCF on projects uh, as, as the, the board or uh, the review process struggled to categorize them within the development or the adaptation space. So, um, so looking at it outside this demarcation or siloed approach um, has, has been growing in this, um, in this space. Uh, and one last point I would like to raise is I think 
uh, the, the the growing evidence base uh, for um, for the synergy and linkages is really growing and um, a lot of um, a lot of interlinkages and trying to address the the underlying vulnerability issues uh, the, the reason why it's not just about the impact or vulnerabilities not just about facing certain climate impacts but about how we have our economy set up how how our systems function how we address our ecosystems how we engage with our uh, private sector for example how our smes uh, usually in developing countries uh, can withstand challenges and then contribute to a, an economy that then builds a, a resilience and adaptive capacity uh, we're seeing a lot of evidence through this, and IPCC um, is 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 bringing in through its reports uh, from this evidence base. So I think the uh, such um, such evidence base really helps uh, draw on alignments. So let me stop here, and then maybe I can come back to uh, to the other points later. Binyam, you kind of raised a very important point that shifted uh, the debate. I mean, it's the kind of evidence that we have why we need uh, to work across climate and development. And that's something I, I, I can see also um, some resources that are on the on the Development Studies Association webpage have been popped uh, into the chat. So please, please have a look at that. And uh, let me just turn now briefly back to Leia, because I'm kind of stressing you work in your work at Eurodata, you work with civil society organizations on the ground. That's one of the kind of uh, the strengths uh, of, of your organization. And that's why I would love to hear from you. I mean, you talk and work, work a lot with civil society in many countries. I mean, what's your take uh, on how development, the climate uh, act or should work together? Do you have any kind of lessons uh, to share with the audience? Yeah, indeed. And I think that this is really core to ensuring that climate finance is effective. It is about it ensuring that we're aware of what different groups and frontline communities on the ground need access to climate finance for. And the the lack of access is a, a real issue for communities, but also countries, but also um, local local civil society organizations as well. Some of the access barriers are around the time that it takes to um, create a, um, an, an application to send it into somewhere like the Green Climate Fund. Other issues are around um, the fact that disbursement rates for climate finance are lower in general than for disbursement rates for development finance. Other issues are around um, language barriers. So the fact that um, the, the forms for submitting a, an application aren't translated into local languages themselves. And I think there are lessons to take from the development sector as well as the humanitarian sector around the types of mechanisms that truly support a, a, a community. So things like um, human rights uh, financing mechanisms like cash-based uh, transfer and ensuring that the communities have access because not everyone has access to a bank account. Not everyone has the same level of ability to access a bank account. Um, there's data from UN Women that shows that um, due to the, the fact that women are often not the owners of the of the land, um, that if they are trying to access um, a state funding in the wake of a climate crisis, uh, of a climate disaster, they often can't access it simply because their name's not, not on the deed. So having things like cash-based transfer does ensure that they are able to um, ensure that they with, within the immediate aftermath that they have access to clean drinking water, to um, shelter, um, to ensure that they're able to provide for their families because there are a lot of impacts that uh, that specifically face women that aren't currently being taken into account with climate finance. So these are some of the lessons that we can take from both development and humanitarian finance as well. But in terms of what our, our, our uh, allies and partners and, and members are saying in, uh, within countries, it is really about ensuring that there is greater access, ensuring that grants can be provided because um, at a national and at a personal level, they do not have the ability to oh, sorry, the capacity to be able to absorb more loans. Um, and then uh, it's also about ensuring that um, that that debt and 
climate and vulnerability metrics are being integrated into climate finance decision making as well, because a lot of the time the focus is just on how can we replicate um, mechanisms that are used in the global north, but those mechanisms may not be appropriate for countries and communities in the global south. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And it's also worth reminding us around, uh, despite the ability perhaps of mobilizing resources at scale, you, we need to make sure that access is simplified. And that's kind of a key message. And there are some kind of, uh, again, some barriers that can be, can be tackled uh, um, earlier on. Before opening up uh, to the question and answers, I know I can see from the chat that there are plenty of kind of questions uh, coming in, uh, but I would love to kind of tackle the, uh, uh, a last a final question with our panel, and this is again very much around the reform of the international financial architecture, um, and particularly how it should evolve. I mean, we spoke about uh, instruments, uh, access to finance, but how should the kind of broad international financial architecture evolve to address both climate and development challenges? A really big question, but I would love to start hearing some of the key messages and somehow some of the recommendations from our panelists. And uh, and we'll kind of come to you first. I mean, what, what changes to the international financial architecture would you prioritize in order for climate and development to be better integrated? Again, I'm mindful this is a very big question for probably the two minutes I, that you might have. I, know, it's okay. I, I, I just not sure I'm qualified as a journalist to, 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 to really answer that in, in a serious way. Um, I think that um, it is like there is clear political appetite for it, though. I think what's it's been so interesting to see the Bridgetown um, agenda kind of grow in, into what it is. Um, you know, it's it's not easy to get a lot of political momentum around basically quite technical um, sort of measures, um, uh, you know, for, for SDRs and, and, and MBB reform and things like that. It's not a trendy sort of topic and it's very difficult to get the attention of, of, of politicians um, who are who are very busy with with, with with other things at the moment. You know, just take a look at what at, at the world and, you know, there's a lot of demands on people's time. So, um I think uh, I, it's going to be interesting to see where where those agendas land. Well, thank you so much, and also um, also from um, from my own kind of humble experience, uh, actually this kind of integration of the agenda has really reached the kind of leaders over the past year. I mean, Mia Motley's kind of bridged down initiative uh, that's kind of cited the reform agenda of the World Bank, the G20 discussions. It's been extremely kind of, and this is not just at the technical level with finance ministries, but even up to the kind of leaders levels, and that's somehow unprecedented. And uh, Chara, can I can I go back to you? I mean, I, I, I would love to hear more. Again, I know you you have a lot of expertise on the trade side, but uh, any kind of big uh, recommendations uh, and something to do with the with international financial architecture and the trade architecture to better integrate climate and development as a key lesson from your side. Well, yeah, thank you for for uh, uh, the question. Well, I've I've been working on the finance reform architecture for for the past two years, so this is not. Uh, outside of what we were doing in, in E3G particularly. Uh, so two points first, I think we need to protect the, the uh, development finance. Uh, it's not just going to be about climate, so development finance needs to be protected. That's uh, point number one. Point number two, we have to think about development pathways in terms of transition. So climate uh, rules or anything that we want to change has to be reflected in development pathways that, that we have looking forward for developing countries particularly. So those are two points. In terms of the architecture reform, I think there are three areas that we have to focus on. Number one is on the liquidity of developing countries. How can we improve it? What kind of uh, uh, reforms can we have to improve liquidity? So that's about uh, more money into banks and so on and so forth. Number two is about currency related risks. How can we improve uh, exchange related risks for developing countries? Uh, that is one of the problems that has not been uh, focused on a lot. Bridgetown number two has focused on that, on that and the African proposals on, on reform also focus on that. So those, that's number two. The third point I'll make is about better governance of the general architecture of uh, finance in general. So that might mean better voting in the in in the uh, institutions, including IFIs and including uh, financial regulatory bodies like the IMF, but also finance providers like the World Bank. So governance, uh, currency, and liquidity. Those are the three main things I think we should focus on. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Shara. And then uh, um, and a number of rec rec uh, recommendations do resonate with me as well. Uh, let me just kind of turn out to, uh, I would like to give Biniam uh, the last kind of uh, intervention because you, you work with the LDC group, uh, you work uh, at the Ministry of Environment, uh, Forest and Climate Change in Ethiopia. So you have really first-hand experience uh, on this. And I would love to kind of hear from your perspective uh, what will be the key priorities for the reform of the international architecture to help us really, I mean, there's a clear message that is coming from the webinar, we need to integrate climate and development, but how should the architecture change? Thanks, I uh, would have loved to go before Chara because he's told some of the things, so I won't be going into them. But I think that we have a big task building on what Will said about trust. We have a big task of rebuilding trust uh, in this multilateral process and uh, international cooperation. Uh, we also need to recognize and capitalize on the, on the momentum. Uh, we need to understand um, that while, for example, we say uh, we package countries uh, within groupings, for example, the, the LDC group or vulnerable countries and all of that, special considerations and specific circumstances of countries need to be considered. Uh, for example, in, um, in war-torn countries, how, how do we ensure that they are not left behind? Uh, so ensuring that um, those who are politically favored don't get the preferential treatment needs to be very, uh, very much considered. Uh, and the, the last point is, uh, we really have to keep up with the commitments of the convention and the Paris Agreement, and the, particularly the, the, the principles. Um, and if we, if we uphold the principles, I think uh, it gives us uh, a lot of response to how we deal with climate finance, uh, particularly uh, in the multilateral process where um, it's not really biased through politics, but very much um, uh, that would meet the demands and priorities of um, of those vulnerable countries. Uh, so let me stop here. Biniam, thank you so much. I mean, uh, um, it, it would be very hard for me to summarize, and already we have quite a number of, uh, of recommendations to put on the table. Uh, I have to say, it's the first time I'm overwhelmed by the number of questions that we received uh, in the question and answers in the chat. Uh, I have to say to everyone uh, uh, participating online, we won't be able to answer all of them, but we'll kind of share them with the panelists. It's it, it's very difficult to kind of choose among them and kind of prioritize them. So thank you so much for being such an engaged audience, but we'll try and then go through as much as we can uh, until uh, uh, for the next 15 minutes. Uh, so I have a kind of a first question that comes from Han Wu, who is the research director at the National Center for Social Research here in London, also from where I speak. Uh, um, we already spoke, and that's probably the most controversial, but also most interesting point right now is around the, the loss and damage fund. So um, I'm who would love to kind of hear the panelists' thoughts uh, around the loss and damage fund uh, that was recently suggested to be managed uh, by the World Bank. Uh, um, how can we make sure that climate finance is not compromised by development purposes? I think uh, you might want also to react on that. Uh, and uh, obviously there's a concerning uh, trade-off here. Who wants to kind of pick up this kind of question? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one uh, um, on the loss and damage fund. Can I, can I, um, I kind of say I'm staring at Binia because you can't really say that, but Binia, would you like to go first? Sure, uh, and I'm worried I might be a little bit biased because uh, I work with the LDC group. So um, I, I think one thing we have to uh, really factor in in this in this multilateral process is that it's a negotiation, right? Uh, every every group brings to the table what they think uh, fits and what their utmost priority is. Uh, and then you meet halfway because the, the extreme position is no text or nothing at all. So uh, I think the the developed developing countries have made a lot of compromise in how uh, they see the loss and damage fund. Um, the 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 delay would risk having anything. So I think it's the the time urgency of loss and damage. Um, the, the need for mobilizing resources and um, and getting a decision that would help us move to the to the next phase of you know there is going to need some time to to establish um, what's agreed within even within the World Bank but with the current um, agreement there is there is an assumption that it would move 
from it, it would evolve from World Bank at some point. Uh, but I think the priority is, uh, or then uh, choosing the the less evil of all this, it would be uh, how do we expedite access? How do we ensure fund is mobilized? And how do we ensure that we don't spend all the time um, that we have at hand discussing architecture of, of what it could look like against uh, meeting the needs of the of the most vulnerable? Thank you, Binyam. I, I have to say, when any time a new fund is kind of set up, there are always kind of discussions and debates on who is going to kind of manage them. That's a kind of a, a, a very important kind of decision uh, and not an easy one. Chara, I can see your hand up. Um, um, please do come in and also Leia afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, just to make a few quick points about the loss and damage fund. In, in, in uh, uh, TC5, the transitional committee's uh, fifth meeting that happened last week, uh, we have a decision to uh, allow the World Bank to be an interim manager of the fund. So interim host of the fund, actually, manager is. So technically, it's managed by an independent body, which would sit at the World Bank. So it's not going to be a World Bank entity. And uh, the developing countries have insisted on a few conditionalities that are attached to uh, giving this fund to the, to the World Bank. And we have we will have to wait six months to see if the World Bank can meet that, that requirement. But uh, there are assurances that are given by the World Bank currently, which would allow them to, to do that. Uh, there are political problems still, though, which we'll, we we have to solve. Which the major one is who pays into the fund and who needs to contribute. And the uh, U.S. Uh, situation, if you've heard in the news or a lot of tweets recently, uh, you would uh, see that the U.S. was opposed to one particular element, which was about who pays into it. And uh, I think the U.S. and most developed countries want to see more countries contributing to the fund, while uh, developing countries insist on develop developed countries taking the lead in in providing funding. Thanks, I'll stop here. Thank you, Leia, over to you. Yeah, thank you, just to add, um, as has already been said, some of the main issues are around the hosting, um, the sources of financing for the fund and the allocation of the finance itself. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about um, countries in the global south, what, south wanting to ensure that the fund has its own legal personality and capacities similar to that of the Green Climate Fund, whereas countries in the global north are wanting the fund that is, host, that is hosted and receives legal and other support in, specifically by the World Bank. And so um, the biggest thing that's at stake is around uh, how fast the fund can be set up and the scale of funding it can raise and um, how it's able to support countries in the global south. Um, I think um, uh, if we look back to, uh, I think it was COP17, um, when the discussions on Green Climate Fund were, uh, were, were being uh, had, um, there was an agreement there around um, ensuring that countries in the global north were the ones who would be providing the finance. And this is a red, a red line for countries in the global north today, which is contributing to why um, the fact that no countries have yet made a commitment to capitalise the fund. So in terms of things that I think are, are really needed. It's about ensuring that at COP28 this year, there's an agreement on ensuring that the fund um, is set up and has uh, that there's eligible access for all countries in the global south and that there is access to grants. But it's also about ensuring that countries at COP29 next year um, also agree to ensure that there is a sub goal on loss and damage under the new collective quantified goal on climate finance, post-2025 climate finance. Um, and this is to ensure that there is um, a formal requirement and relationship between the loss and damage fund and the UNFCCC's global climate finance goals. And that's crucial for capitalization of the fund and replenishment thereafter of the fund as well. Um, I'll stop there because of time, but there's lots to be said on the loss and damage fund. And uh, we'll probably kind of leave a number of kind of resources on the web page of this seminar. So uh, for all of you kind of interested in, in this kind of uh, area, please do have a look at it. Uh, I have a kind of a question now that it comes from Ilaria Crotti from UNCTAD, uh, and this is particularly, this is directed to Chara. There is more and more interest in integrating climate considerations into trade policy, but there is an increasing tendency in developed countries to address climate change with unilateral trade-related measures uh, that are actually damaging development perspective of developing, of developing countries. 
how do you see the role of multilateralism, multilateral trade in this context? And how can we address development goals with the realm of climate and trade initiatives? It's a big question, but um, the one also going back to the policy coherence uh, Binyam was talking about earlier. Yes, well, uh, I think that's been uh, of interest to a lot of people. So this comes from uh, the CBAM uh, uh, issue mostly. And uh, when countries take uh, measures that they do for climate uh, purposes, then how does that interact with their other obligations is, is the big question. But uh, there is a process that is created within the UNFCCC mechanism that could have solved this but it hasn't worked properly. So response, response measures within the UNFCCC mechanism was uh, a place to think about these things. How do response measures to climate change affect other obligations and other, other uh, rights for, of other countries? And we haven't had uh, detailed negotiations on this, but that's where we're going. And the other aspect of uh, uh, the negotiations within the UNFCCC framework is to look at these things in, in, in the framework of just transition. We have a work program that just started out uh, this year on just transition uh, work. So that could look at this potentially. Uh, but there are other uh, issues of this. So for example, the most effective way in terms of uh, doing uh, climate action between countries that have comparable uh, levels of commitments to climate change might be to do these things uh, uh, in, in a club. So that's where, for example, the Germans were putting their arguments in saying we need to create a climate club to push for, for these things because multilateral processes usually don't create the same amount of movements forward for countries that are at the same level of uh, uh, development and at the same level of regulations and so on and so forth. But the problem is in the global context, how do we bring everybody on board and how do we protect the interests of countries? And this also goes back to what I mentioned earlier, we have to protect not just the economies of countries, but also economic trajectories towards development in the future. And what kind of transitions should we envisage is, is the question. And we have a lot of uh, leaders in this in this regard. For example, Bolivia pushes on, on this agenda a lot in the, in the uh, climate negotiations, and they want to see some concrete conversations on this happening. Uh, the WTO is doing a few things as well to uh, create a space for countries to come and talk about uh, these measures before they go into, into debates. But we're expecting a few cases to, to appear in the WTO uh, dispute settlement system uh, based on uh, uh, challenges to the CBAM and, and other sectoral arrangements, for example, on steel, on uh, aluminium, and, and so on and so forth. Let me stop here. Charles, thank you so much. I know that's a big topic that might kind of warrant a separate kind of discussion again, as I said earlier on, uh, and perhaps a kind of a blog on this. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but let me try and kind of pick one one question that is relatively broad. I mean, uh, will you kind of mentioned uh, the role of innovative financing to bridge the kind of gap. I mean, we talked a lot about access, but we also need to remember that we need to increase the pie. I mean, any kind of... Uh, um, any kind of suggestions of where we can exploit innovative financing? Are there any kind of options out there or we should go back to the kind of existing sources? I know it's a big question and also have a, myself some kind of doubts around what's innovative financing, but any other sources that we can really tap into to help countries tackle the climate and development challenge that we haven't mentioned before and you would like to put on the table? Anyone who wants to elaborate on this? I might kind of pick on... Uh, on Leia, um, as I know Eurodad has, an, has done a lot of work on innovative finance. Uh, um, Leia, would you like to take up the challenge? Uh, I Sure, I can. Um, I also wanted to quickly come back on the point on trade as well, and also flag that um, the aid for trade under the, the OECD has been doing some work around this. And in the context of the UNFCCC negotiations, tax barriers have been highlighted as um, an issue with regards to countries in the global south having access to relevant climate technologies that are traded with a lot of those royalties have going towards the global north and then um, further indebting those countries. But in terms of um, innovative sources of, of climate finance, um, there's been a lot of um, discussion around uh, the different mechanisms that can be used. As, as Eurodad, we have specifically been um, highlighting the role that debt cancellation can pay, can play, sorry, um, in the context of um, uh, ensuring that um, a country has access to uh, finance within its own coffers um, 
in in the uh, event of a climate event, but also highlighting that there's a need to ensure that there are debt suspension mechanisms as well um, that are being included within um, uh, loan agreements. Unfortunately, 70% of, of climate finance is provided in the form of loans. There's a need for there to be binding responsible binding borrowing responsible borrowing and lending principles that are being implemented, as well as uh, uh, suspension uh, clauses, some of which were mentioned at the Paris summit in June, the Macron summit as well. Um, some other civil society organizations have been highlighting the role of a climate damages tax. I think for you, Adad, we would first want to uh, take a look at the, the regressive impacts of some of these um, uh, types of mechanisms on communities in the global south, because sometimes they, they can have an impact if, for instance, subsidies are being cut what impact would that have on the community, on a, on on women, etc. So I, I think there's um, some of these discussions are have been around for a long time, but I do think there is a need to ensure that before we start um, uh, highlighting them all, that we do look at those regressive impacts too, because we don't want to undermine sustainable development either. Thank you. Thank you, Leia. Willa, over to you. Yeah, just quickly, I know we're tight on time. Um, I think it's really important to consider the 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 political sort of implications of a, of a lot of these things. There's you know there's there's numerous different ways: airline taxes, shipping taxes, um, any sort of taxes on carbon that you know um, can be applied and you know make a lot of money in countries in the global north. Whether voters will accept them is is is, is a completely different issue, and you know it's really important for everyone watching to remember that climate environment is being set up as a political wedge issue in a lot of um, uh, global north countries at the moment. So um, I think it's really important when talking about climate finance and thinking about what can be done. Um, rem just remembering the political situation is pretty tricky as well. Thank you so much. Uh I would love to have booked a kind of an hour and a half or two hours for this discussion because I'm so sorry we won't be able. It's been an impressive number of comments, questions. Uh, as it was popped up in the chat, uh, Barowina, we'll take all the questions back to the panelists uh, and we'll share resources as well uh, on the web page. I mean, it's also very difficult for me to summarize. There were a number of points that I would like to briefly reiterate in terms of the kind of challenges. I mean, access to finance, a speed uh, around accessing finance, the need for affordable finance. We shouldn't kind of forget about the implications for that and the kind of push for grant financing, but most importantly, transparency on what's climate finance. I mean, I would have loved to kind of elaborate on this and uh, the need to build trust. I mean, as we go into neg ne negotiations, uh, we need to, have to re build and regain trust across all the different parties. And to me, that's very kind of important on top of keeping up with the momentum and also to ensure that uh, policies uh, within a kind of a government are coherent. Uh, and that's one of the key points also Binyam was kind of mentioning. And uh, again, uh, we we discussed a lot around the integration of climate and development from different kind of angles, but one of the key points, and again, I would encourage DSA members to kind of share resources uh, evidence-based recommendations and the evidence that has been growing that we really need to kind of uh, integrate climate and development was a clear kind of driver to simplify and move ahead with this kind of dialogue. So let's remember about the role that many of us as academic, as researchers can bring to this very kind of heated, we talked about loss and damage, this is a very heated and timely debate. So. Unfortunately, that's all, all, all That's all we have time for. We are already kind of at 1.30 p.m. in the UK, but there are a number of ways to kind of continue the conversation. I mean, uh, as I mentioned a number of times, and also in the chat, I will share, share resources uh, um, on the discussion that we had uh, today. I would love uh, everyone to mark uh, their calendars uh, for the um, um, annual conference of the Development Studies Association. Uh, it will take place uh, between uh, 
from June 26 to June 28 uh, in London at SOAS. Uh, if you subscribe to all the kind of social media channels and the newsletter, you will receive all the information around the timing to, um, to submit panel proposals and to register. And of course, there's also the option of kind of joining uh, our study groups uh, within the SA, and that's one on envir environment and natural resources and climate change. But if you like to be part of these discussions, I would like to reiterate, uh, you can follow us on social media. We have a very active link in group. We are on Facebook, we are on X, formerly known as Twitter. You can join the study groups or even consider becoming a member of DSA and come to our conference and all the links should be popped on in the chat. So I would like to thank you, our panelists. It's been a very engaging, interesting and thoughtful discussion. And I would like to thank all of you online, so many, so engaging and so many questions. And I would like to say goodbye for now.